I'm Holly Figueroa. I am just the moderator for this panel because this is the product of a Twitter conversation. We started a Twitter conversation on game accessibility, game design, and game difficulty, and how they all related to each other. And I threw out a question to the, my colleagues on the Twitterverse, and we had some great discussion. And, and I think we all learned something. So we wanted to continue that with, instead of just some colleagues, with actually some experts and, and applied, applied knowledge as well. Um, so I'm gonna let you kick, that's me. Bryant, do you wanna intro yourself? Yeah, um, I'm Bryant Cannon. Uh, I'm the lead engineer at Night School Studio. We uh, just, or we released a, a game called Oxen Free two years ago, uh, almost today. Um, and we're working on a game called After Party that comes out next year. Hi everybody, I'm Bryce Johnson. I'm a designer at Xbox, where I work with our software teams and our hardware teams and our game studios. Um, primarily around inclusive design, and what we do is we try to make um, our products accessible to everyone. Hi, I'm Heidi McDonald. I'm the senior creative director for an organization called iThrive. Um, what we do is we promote the development of games that increase positive psychology practices, such as empathy and kindness. I'm the game expert on a team of scientists who are using real science to figure out how we can develop games for those outcomes. And I'm Mark Barley. I'm the founder and executive director of the Able Gamers Charity, and I have a really good voice projection, which is why I don't need a microphone. <laughs> no mic required. <laughs> so let's kick this off, first of all, by... Oh, and I wasn't on the Twitter conversation. I just invited myself to this panel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's start off by defining difficulty, which is how the Twitter conversation started is what does difficulty mean to you, and what does it maybe mean to your users, and is that different? Start with me. Um, to me, difficulty kind of serves two, has two definitions in games. Uh, the first one is kind of um, like what, who's your target audience? Like what's the literacy level, um, like the, the, the gaming literacy level uh, that your audience is comfortable with? Uh, and the other is like uh, when you have like a uh, you're scaling difficulty in the game because we're trying to teach the player something through the game mechanics, um, and so we use difficulty to kind of uh, set a lesson plan for teaching those players those mechanics. Yeah, I mean, I I think the one misconception about people who advocate for accessibility in games is that they they, they don't want difficulty, and and that's you know, the furthest thing from the truth. I mean, difficulty is why we play games, assonance, dissonance. I think the way that we look at it, though, is that we look at this idea of difficulty as not um, a single, like, unified spectrum, but it is a bunch of independent attributes mm -hmm. that can be applied across sort of in many facets. So I, I really, when I talk to people about uh, difficulty, I actually talk to them about fit a lot, like this idea of custom fit difficulty, like. How do you tune difficulty for one person? And I think that that fit is an opportunity for us as an industry. I think difficulty is tied very closely to player motivation because if you look at uh, Nick Yee's site called Quantic Foundry, he has a really cool uh, survey that you can take which will spit out, uh, here is one of 14 motivations that are important to you when you're playing, right? And so there is a motivation called mastery, and mastery is like the Masso core games, the people who are going and say, I love Dark Souls because it's really, really hard, right? So there is going to be a class of people for whom the difficulty of your game is a challenge and they love it. But other than that, I think difficulty has to do with things that might impede your player from having an enjoyable experience mm -hmm. of the game. You know, if, if I am a deaf person and your game is an audio game, you know, that's gonna impact my ability to enjoy your game. So just any factor that would, if missing, would impede your ability to enjoy the game. And to that point, difficulty to me is the joy, the joy of progressing through your game. So, mm -hmm. you know, if, if I'm not enjoying moving forward in your game, then it's too difficult and I'm done. Yeah. 
I tend to define difficulty as the f that friction. But that friction looks different to me even throughout my day. So this idea of sliders and, and that continuum where it's not, it's not linear, it's a whole bunch of different options that you can scale and change at any time. Um, as, a, as my own personal self playing a game, I change my difficulty needs throughout the day. It might not just be physical either. Um, our organization deals more in the mental health space, and so there can be a game, like there was a really important game that came out a couple years ago called That Dragon Cancer, which was made by a father uh, who had a child die of cancer. That game was too emotionally difficult for me, yeah. and I was just, I, as if, all, all I had to do was hear about the premise, and I was just like, nope. I was, on, I, I, oh, I was on a judging panel for Games for Change, and they gave me five games to play, and one of them was on coming out, which was really interesting. One was about surviving the Holocaust. One was a mental health game, and I literally kind of, they critiqued at the end, like, well, how was your experience? And I'm like, if you look at what you gave me, you laid it on real thick. Yeah. And they're like, oh, we didn't even think about that, because the other panel got, like, you know, coming out and, you know, fleeing Iraq. I'm like, these games are too heavy. You yeah. need to give me two, not five. Yeah, A Mortician's Tale, my, my grandma passed away, <gasps> and A Mortician's Tale was, was actually the way I realized I hadn't dealt with it, and I, I had to stop playing and kind of remove myself, but then continue to use the game to deal with that. It, w it was a beautiful way to to deal with it, it just was something that, yeah, my first initial response. I yeah, we, do we it. shouldn't say that those games don't have a place or shouldn't be built. Yeah. It's just that there are certain considerations that are going to go along mm. with that. Um, like, do you want to think about trigger warnings? Do you want to think about um, changing the perspective of who the player is in relation to what's going on? Um, one of the things we see with empathy games is people will try to make a game that traumatizes their player in the name of understanding and awareness, and that might not be the best way to go about it. Mm -hmm. So there are considerations around that of, you know, this is a how whole do you do it well? other aspect of difficulty that, like, really, I don't think as an industry we fully, like, fully understood. Psychology is so important in games. We, we use psychology in games without knowing it all the time, and difficulty is probably still one of those things that hasn't actually clicked for myself included amongst many, many people. I mean, I would, I would caution us to be um, very precise with our language, too. I think, mm. I think us in the gaming industry, we like, to, we like these big buckets of terms like cheating and yeah. toxicity and difficulty. And there's a lot of nuance and a lot of, of things in there. So I, I mean, one of the things that I think we as an industry need to do when we think about how we classify games is to have a very precise way of kind of saying, this is what this game is, this is what you can expect, whether it's a trigger warning or whether it's the fact that, hey, you know, if you're not twitchy, if you don't have like the twitchy fingers of a 17 year old, you're not gonna like this game. Mm. That's content labels, right? Like, yeah, honestly, it's metadata. Yeah, I like that word a lot. Um, this is, if, this is something interesting, if um, barriers in the game versus your unique abilities as a player, is another definition to define difficulty. Difficulty is this, so like, how do you go about designing something like that? It really needs to be designed from core mechanic up, especially for looking for options upon options, which really is awesome. How do you go about designing something like that? Well, I think a lot of it uh, is, um, like, you start with your core audience, right? Like, you, you need to figure out who you're making this game for, what their, their literacy level in games is. Um, I really also, like that word, literacy. literacy. I like that. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Um, like for Oxenfree, for example, like we, we set out to make a game for people who didn't necessarily play a lot of games, who mm. didn't know um, that generally A is used for confirming things and B is to back out of things, right? That's something that just from playing years and years of games, you uh, just kind of get accustomed to and you kind of assume. Um, so we try to build it from the ground up. Um, and, uh, and our game's kind of unique in that we don't have much like, we're, we're not, we weren't trying to make a difficult, a difficult game. Uh, but I guess, yeah, there is that like kind of emotional difficulty in like, uh, in, in the game, uh, your the main character's uh, brother 
uh, had recently passed away, and that's something that could be very emotionally difficult to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, and as you play the game, the, the, the choices you have, the dialogue choices you have, kind of get more and more um, serious and, uh, and weighty. Yeah. Um, so I can see definitely how that's kind of similar to a difficulty ramp. Um, but, but yeah, even, the, what? even Oxenfree has quite an interesting design, like U UI system mm -hmm. in it as well. When you guys started, now this is a direct question to you, when you guys started designing that UI, what did you, did you use a reference? Is it just something that naturally came out of the way the game was developed? Uh, I guess the reference was uh, other story-based games, mm -hmm. where uh, like uh, The Walking Dead or um, just any like narrative uh, game where you have dialogue options, Mass Effect. Um, but uh, we wanted to make that the the focus of the game, so we mapped all that to the face buttons, um, and that that way, like, you have you know these three options on screen; those match up match up to the three face buttons, and it's very it's very intuitive as to how very. that works. We don't have to to teach the player too much. We just have to say, the first time a choice comes up, hey, hit the, use these three buttons, and they're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. They're in the same position, right? comes to designing that that system, what is what is some advice? <laughs> I, I mean, I always just encourage people to, um, and I mean, I, I said this in my talk, is just to, to make sure that you're not coming in with too many um, preconceptions of your own experiences, like your own kind of literacy. Yeah, I like, love that. You know, exactly. Like, just just kind of go out there in the world and, and talk to other people. Don't don't always start from this place where you could be influenced by your own biases. So. I'd say test from very early stages, even from concept stages, um, with two very important groups. One is the group of people who you want to include, and the other mm -hmm. is with subject matter experts who, who know about that kind of thing. Sure. Um, I worked at Shell Games for a while with Jesse Shell, and I was the narrative designer on a project called uh, Play Forward Elm City Stories, which was a game that was an HIV prevention game targeted at um, 11 to 14 year old African American students. Wow. And now I'm about as far as you can get from an 11 to 14 year old <laughs> African American child. And so I realized very quickly that this had to be handled very carefully mm. because we didn't want to be condescending or patronizing or offensive in any way whatsoever. And, you know, I just felt a real weight of responsibility to do it the right way. Mm. And so what I did was I wrote down my story ideas and we went to an after school program where these, where these kids hung out after school. And uh, I would read the story and they'd act out the story in front of me. And so a lot of the dialogue in that game uses the exact phraseology that these kids were using um, because we knew it would be relatable to the kids. Mm. And it's for these kids, right? So let's, let's include them. And, and what I found is when you reach out to include the people that you're trying to include, they are so happy that you asked. They're like really happy to help you because they're so happy that you cared and that you asked and you're trying to do the right thing. And it's like, what isn't cool about helping to design a video game? Pay them still. <laughs> they still deserve to be paid. Representation yes. <laughs> is, is a barrier as well. If I don't feel represented, I don't feel that I can access that world, which is, is part of the inclusion and Yes, in, in this case, we could also include it in difficulty. It's a friction for me to be able to play the game if representation isn't there. When it comes to able gamers, how, how easy is it to reach out to the audience that you're, you're kind of in this middle ground, you, you work directly with um, persons with disabilities as well as game developers and publishers directly. What is that like in terms of reaching out for design difficulty? So it was really hard for a long time. Um, but I will say in the last year, 18 months, a lot of the major studios, um, PlayStation, I think, has done this. I know that, um, I know PlayStation through Naughty Dog and some of their work have put some accessibility guidelines on all their first party studios. I know Microsoft has done that as well in their first party studios where the work that Able Gamers has been doing for years and years, which is to show that people with disabilities are a market, that we have the money that we want to spend, has finally resonated. And I think, um, you know, 
I'm, I'm now no longer pointing out accessibility features in games. I'm kind of almost now pointing out places where they're missing, where I would expect them, because accessibility, especially in the last year and a half or so, has become really a norm. I mean, one of the games that came out, Battlefield 1, had a colorblind mode, but they actually implemented it incorrectly because they didn't reach out to the colorblind community. They just went and read a thing online. <laughs> and as soon as the game went out, like Twitter exploded. Mm -hmm. But they then immediately brought people in and said, well, we clearly messed up. We tried. What do we do to fix it? And one of the first big patches that came out for Battlefield 1 fixed their colorblind mode. Wow. That's exciting. And they're just also good design. Um, I was talking about in my talk, EA used to win all the time our Game Accessibility of the Year Award, and it was because they had a really good design model that and, the, and a budget that allowed them to create good design. But even f Battlefield 1, as an example, has cognitive features built in it, accessibility features that are cognitive that no one ever knows. Ooh. Who here plays Battlefield 1? So you're always the blue, and you're always trying to get a circle. And no matter what side of the team you're on, you're always blue, and your enemy's always a diamond, and you're always, it deals with colorblind, but it also deals with cognitive, because you don't have to remember what side you're on. Yeah. Red is bad, it's a diamond, I want it to be a blue circle. That's actually a cognitive Perfect. accessibility feature. I think one of the, the greatest things that I've seen over the past few years is the advocacy that Able Gamers has done has sort of permeated the industry so that I get to be in a place where when I go to, um, when I talk with our first party developers, it's not 101. We get to, we get to kind of jump in a bit more. Like, sure, they get that they have to do colorblind and controller remapping, and they get that they, that they need to do um, things like better subtitles. So we can start to have a conversation about how we actually like go beyond, and we can start to talk about innovative mechanics. We can start to talk about um, those things of, of really including broader audiences. To your point, I mean, I'm doing a talk at GDC this year on blind gaming, an area that we used to avoid like the plague because it was so hard. Mm -hmm. But now that we've gotten through the 101 and, and now I expect this real basic stuff to be done, we can now start having these more in-depth conversations. I really like um, designing for your intended audience pairs and this li concept of literacy pairs so well with reaching out to those communities and bringing them in to get design like on that ground level. Um, when you're designing for a, a specific audience, so many times our own biases bleed into that. Um, when it comes to designing for a specific audience but across different devices, did you guys do anything different with your iPad? version than you did, or the mobile version? When, it, when it comes to accessibility, no, sadly. Like, no. That, that was kind of like a very fast port, uh, but. It's, it's still like, an, I mean, there are so many players on your iOS version. Yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful game. I'm really, just by the way it's designed, maybe not on purpose, it mm. truly is accessible. Yeah. Um, the screen reader can pick up on all the text, mm. the, Speech bubbles are in a predictable location, yeah. so. And a lot of that's just good design. Like mm -hmm. generally, if you, like, you'll get, I, f I feel like you'll get 80 to 90% of the way there just by designing the game well. Like not making tiny text on the screen and not like, you know, getting things, making things hidden in your UI too deeply, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, we tried to play test the, the original game as early as possible. like. Halfway through our development cycle, we like once we had like a prototype where you can move a capsule around and it had like <laughs> it had dialogue options over it. We would just we would have just like friends and family like try it out and see if that made sense. Um, I'm hoping for this next game we can do a little bit more though. Like I don't we we didn't do a lot of intentional um, design for accessibility. A lot of it was just like that 80, 80 to 90 percent like we're a tiny studio, but we we just tried to make design the game. Uh, the UI well, um, but yeah, I'm hoping we can make that like last 10 to 20 percent for uh, for our after party. Part of the same, part of the same inclusion. Um, really, I love I love your talk when we talk about um, there is no average. If I'm designing for an average person, that average person doesn't exist. Nobody actually fits into a men's medium. It's always like, well, sleeves are a little too long, or your shirt's a little too short, or you know what. Women's, it's even like, we're not, like, that's not even a real thing. Um, 
So I comes down to design. <laughs> well, and, and, and we, we do have lots of things in our world that, like, you would never buy, you'd never go shopping for a car and expect to buy a small, medium, or large car, right? Like, you, you, you know, you couldn't have a car that, like, your significant other, if you're, like, a foot taller or a foot shorter, than you have to have two different cars. So, you know, ergonomics is a well-known field, and, mm. and we just need to apply the learnings from that field to other things. So 10 years ago or so, um, Raf Koster wrote a book called Theory of Fun, and in there he talks about flow and how important it is to have your players maintain a state of flow. And within that 10 years, that concept of flow that Raf Koster talked about is now being taught in all the game programs all over the world. You know, that if you go to game design class, it's like, yes, flow is a thing, it needs to be. <laughs> and, um, we were talking at one of our design hives about how what if designing for things like empathy and that isn't just we want to design these things to make you feel good. Maybe it's just like Raf Koster's float. Maybe it's just a question of good design. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm hearing right now from Brian. It's like it you know, we don't we aren't doing it because it's the right thing to do. We're doing it just because it's good design. It's good. <laughs> and so that's that's what this this answer might actually be is like if you are designing well, you are designing for the maximum number of people. But difficulty then, I mean, to, to that point, I think you're, you're onto something, which is so difficulty is really around the friction of flow. Mm. Yeah. You and know? How, and so I would say that Dark Souls is a perfect example of that. There's not a great flow to that game. Like, it's, I love that people have that mastery and like, domination of a skill but if your skill is figuring out a flow how do we or if difficulty is an interruption of flow or a friction of flow how do you s skill levels well but i think levels? flow i mean flow is just as individual as as everything else so mm -hmm. what what one person considers flow might be something that you consider like not flow at all yeah, I, th I think the flow chart is like difficulty over skill level, right? So you can have like as you uh, your target audience has better skill, you can increase that difficulty. It's not always a bad thing, sure. right? Like so, something like Dark Souls it re just requires that that high level of literacy, that like high like base, like I, c I know how to swing a sword in a game, and I g generally know that there's you know a certain time that I'm invincible while I'm swinging the sword and then I'm, then I'm vulnerable, stuff like that. Sure. Um, so, so, yeah. Uh, Even design errors, right? Like there are so many classic games that you had to, this concept of literacy, where you, you knew that like your hitbox was just slightly off. Yeah, yeah. AGDQ just happened where yeah. we're exploiting all these things and that really is a flow at that point in time. Um, I, I need to fangirl over Cuphead for just a second. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do not like platformers at all because yeah. I am not skilled at them at all because I have, you know, I have rheumatoid arthritis and so there are times when my hands are not doing the things that I really want them to do very, very much and uh, Cuphead is a notoriously difficult game but it was my favorite game of last year because they made failure so much fun uh. and so while everybody else is complaining about, oh my god, I just died again I just took so much joy and so much whimsy out of the failure, and so I wonder if maybe making failure fun hmm. with some of these more difficult titles might be, might be a consideration, too. Well, I don't know. I, I do think that, I mean, since we're on this topic of flow, I do think it is important to really recognize that state of flow. Um, I know for me, uh, is anyone familiar with the Mary Meeker report? It comes out every year out of the valley. It's basically this like kind of Bible that happens. And this year was the first year they had a huge gaming section in the Mary Meeker report. So basically, you know, this is the year that the valley decided that they're coming for games. <laughs> and there's a, there's a part in the report that specifically talks about like auto-tuning difficulty um, uh, to keep people in flow. And so if you think about the economics of like the valley, and the stuff that kind of comes out of there, it is about eyeballs, it is about time spent. So having people die and leave, no matter what the reason is anti, like is basically counterproductive to their business goals. They want people playing. So I think it'll be really interesting to see how games evolve in the next few years based on, you know, based on non-game makers getting into gaming, basically. This is, this is actually coming full circle again, arcade games 
knew how to do this, right? Like to get you to put that coin instantly back in and hit start and you hop back in and you, that energy that you had, it didn't, dying was fun, I mean frustrating, but fun. You died and there was like quick, like continue, or it was like, it was half the credits to continue and, and these monetization and, and retention strategies are strategies that we've had for a long time but kind of forgot. I thought we've, we've covered like all of my questions and like I think we're doing fairly good on time. Did you guys have anything else that you were like, this is prompting something I hadn't thought of? One of the things we're working on at iThrive right now is trying to figure out, um, is it possible to design an empathy game on purpose? Mm. And I'm asking that because Oxenfree was something that I thought was one of the best empathy games of last year, and I expect to have some very interesting conversations with these <laughs> folks about whether they set out to do that or whether it happened by accident, right? It's like Lucas Pope, who made Papers, Please. I don't think that he sat down and said, I'm going to make a really good empathy game, but that doesn't mean he didn't do it, mm. right? And so what we have to figure out right now is the people who did make a good game, did they do it on purpose? And if so, what things did they use? Is this something that we can take and apply to other designs? Or is this something that we can come up with a design for independently of games that are already made? That's something we're trying to figure out. And I guess that would also extend to other types of ability. Yeah, I mean, in our practice in gaming for everyone, we talk about intentionality a lot. Mm. Um, we have a saying that if you don't intentionally include, you're going to unintentionally exclude. And if you intentionally exclude, you're kind of a jerk. <laughs> but so that intentionality is really important. And I mean, even Mark and I were talking about this yesterday. There's lots of happy accidents that happen that we, that we can learn. But I think it's important for when those happy accidents happen that we document, understand what made them great. And then the next time we, we do it intentionally. Mm -hmm. Accidental accessibility saying, oh, this was good, let's make sure we bring that forward to, yeah. because Forza is an example where Forza actually won our competition and then the next Forza was actually much more inaccessible than the year prior. Um, the one that had the Top Gear mm -hmm. people on it actually took a regression in accessibility and then the next one kind of corrected those issues. Yeah, we do that a lot at Microsoft. We go yeah. for forward and back and <laughs> yeah. we kind of like, it's, it's, if I mean, you're there, you get out, it. I'm not calling you out to be rude. I'm just saying like. No, no, I totally was, see why it happens. And actually, if you talk to the team, I mean, Aaron, who's one of the physics designers, you know, we talk about accessibility a lot. And he talks about like, well, I made this mode for my kids. And you're like, oh, yeah, it's the same thing. Well, you know, <laughs> you know, when, I was, when I was at Microsoft one time, they have, um, Microsoft does a really good job on closed captioning. And the use case that, that we were talking about was called the um, uh, sleeping baby use case which Microsoft did a study and they found out that a lot of people that played their games were 28 to 35 year old males that were sneaking downstairs and playing after the baby went to sleep. And so they actually assumed that a lot of them would have the volume really low or turned off because if you woke up the baby, your wife was going to destroy you. Yes. So they yes. were designing, <laughs> yes, so they were designing <laughs> games with this one use case as part of their thing, which was the sleeping baby use case. How can you consume this game with no sound? Now that was great for the deaf gamer, yeah. but they weren't in setting out to say, we want our game to be accessible for, for, for the deaf. They were saying, we want our game to be able to be played by a 32 year old guy with a newborn baby and a wife. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, do, do you guys remember, um, if, I don't know if you've seen the Xbox one, but do you remember when we had snap mode? I'll tell you where that came from. We saw a post on Reddit where some guy was playing Titanfall and he'd snap his baby monitor on the side of his screen so that he could like watch his kid yeah. at the same time. Yeah. So, you know, all that stuff kind of happens, right? Like that's where a lot of that inspiration kind of comes from. Um, it's like, oh yeah, that's a thing, let's do that. One of our, <laughs> one of our friends is creating the, um, the kid mode where you can play local co-op and the kid has the controller and is kind of more just like running around and having fun, yeah. but still experiencing the game. Forza does the same thing where you can turn on to like where you don't have collision. Yeah, you right. You still, I mean, you still have to like drive and, but it, it's much. It switches a hard game to a casual game sure. with the with an option. Well, I mean, it, it's, okay. really, it's really it's um, really interesting to think about what cases of emergent play are going on with games too. Mm. Like I have a 13 year old son, 
and we bought Assassin's Creed Origin, and Sorry. we have never played through the story or played the game the way it's supposed to be played because the first time that we ever logged in, my son decided it was way more fun to stampede camels, uh, camels through marketplaces <laughs> and commandeer boats and try to run over the birds. And so that's really literally all we've ever done is my, my 43, try to run over My 45-year-old husband did the same thing. <laughs> I'm like, are you advancing the story? He's like, why? Watch this. <laughs> yeah, like in, in Syndicate, the stagecoach crashes alone are totally worth buying yeah. the game. So it's like um, it, finding, finding out about your players, you know, what ways of playing the game are there that mm. are unconventional that you don't know about, and how can that inform your designs going forward? Cool. And again, you're throughout the day, you changed. You on your way to work. Uh, you're kind of a zombie. You get to work. You're maybe you're on your lunch. You're playing something a bit more. But you're hardcore. working. You're not playing. Games. <laughs> so you're on your way home back from work. You're like I'm. I am in no mood to play a game. I I'm driving. I can't watch drive a, and play games. <laughs> I want to watch a color changing wheel. So one of our one of the ways that we sell blind game or one of the ways that I try to sell blind gaming within Xbox is driving and playing games. So basically taking the situational impairment of an eyes-free situation, which is driving, oh. and then figuring out how to apply well, that to that. games. I'm stealing that. Yoink. Yeah, you totally should. It's fine. I'd love, that to, I'd love that to be a thing, like drive. I seriously would love it if in a few years we had driving games. I, I'm sure, I think like, we're already I there. I don't think we need That'll this, be on my though. tombstone. No, I think, yeah, I think we're already there, because my, um, my friend Eddie Webb, who made Pugmire, and he's written for a lot of different... Um, franchises like Futurama, Vampire the Masquerade, stuff like that. Um, he co-invented a company called Earplay. And what Earplay does is they're, they're trying to make games to go with the Alexa system and stuff like that where it's just totally auditory and you can be driving in your car and then you tell the Alexa, it's like a story game, yeah. right? A choose your own adventure that's done totally auditory. Which and you can choose. Again, is a classic game mechanic. Yeah. These like text-based, choice-based games are something that we, we really loved. We poor oxen free to that. <laughs> <laughs> That would be amazing. <laughs> but it might, it might, we might not have to worry about it because, I mean, self-driving cars, we might actually be able to play a to game. To play your game? Because what else are you going to do? Like, right. except me, I would just be in terror looking for a steering wheel the whole time. <laughs> Something to calm that anxiety. <laughs> Any other closing thoughts or remarks? Yeah. We'll open it for questions in just a second. Um, going back to what you were saying about empathy, um, uh, it's it's an it's an interesting interesting thought because that's like to me that's like why we tell stories so like kind of goes hand in hand in hand with with games with characters and stories and that's totally what we were trying to do so um, yeah I'm like I'm really excited for the day when or it, we're, we kind of are in the day in a time where uh, games can join like m books and and films as like. Uh, where, where, where dif the difficulty is the accessibility, or, or sorry, the, the difficulty is a mixing of words. Difficulty is like the emotional uh, journey you take. So. so do you see an Oscar for games at some point? I actually really we, do. We, we kind of have that a little bit with the IGF and with the yeah. Developer's Choice Awards. Um, but, but I'd I like to see it become like a mainstream. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I've talked to friends about this a lot. Like it, the, the hard thing about games is that we don't have the equivalent of movie stars. We have a voice actors, and that's um, like like a, a, a an audience based um, like part of the development team that is that is uh, that is forward facing to the audience, right? Like the 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 directors and writers and programmers and designers of, of video games aren't as uh, forward facing to. Yeah, I think right it's, it's, hard, it's hard to make that. Like you still a have show. storytelling. You have cinematography. Yeah, you yeah. have. I think devs are famous to other devs. Yeah, like, yeah. I will, st you know, like to this day, if I see Dave Gator, who who made Dragon Age, if I see him walking yeah. around, I will turn into a stuttering fourteen-year-old girl. Oh, okay? he and I had he and I like hung out for like had dinner like three nights in a row, and of I text and you I did. text him all. I kid you not, I text him all the time because he has a chocolate blog. I don't know if you ever oh, his chocolate blog. So like I just like <laughs> randomly send him chocolate, and he texts me like, "Got your chocolate? Was amazing." Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I could text him on my phone when we're done. He's, he's probably going to roll his eyes and be like, oh, yeah, her. 
Yeah, me and the Fallout guy too. We all had lunch together. Yeah, I think. Um, oh, uh, Aslar. Yeah. Oh, he's one of my buddies. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, it's cool. Yeah, I think that right now devs are rock stars to other devs. But mm. if you would say any of those names to people outside of games, they'd be like, who? Like they, they know who. Like gamers know who like Hideo Kojima and Will Wright are, and that's it. <laughs> you know, Pretty like. much. <laughs> There's also, but there, there's actually a blending of, this is so off topic now, um, I'm gonna <laughs> say this and then divert us back. There's a blending and maybe we can learn something about good design as the movie industry picks up more and more of our tools, Unreal, Unity, like custom engines, etc. Th that line is blurring quickly and it turns out that they have way better workflows than, than we do, um, established workflows. Ours is a little bit more wild west. Um, and I feel like there's a bit of borrowing from both that can definitely happen in terms of accessibility and good design. Um, so with that, um, I would love to open this up. These, this is an incredible group of resources up here. If you have any questions, please, please ask them now. Um, hit them up on the Twitterverse, et cetera. Um, I, curious, uh, great panel, by the way. I'm curious what you guys think of Hellblade. Uh, you know, to me, it was interesting as a game because it made the topic of mental illness uh, more accessible to people who wouldn't otherwise understand it. You know, a lot of gamers could sort of relate to uh, this problem of you know seeing things that aren't really there uh, because of the way that was built into the gameplay. Um, but there's also a lot of people, say, who are interested in mental illness, I guess, who probably couldn't play that game because it required so much hardcore skill. And I thought they had an interesting solution to that with um, a 25-minute video documentary that they built into the game, you know, that had all of the sort of connection to real-life mental illness. Uh, so I just wondered what you guys think about that. I've not actually played that one yet, but I know that my team at iThrive is well aware of that game, and we are examining it right now for um, is, is there any education we can do around that game? Um, is that, are there any studies that can be done around that game to show that it helps people that way? Um, I know that there are mixed reactions to it. Some people think it's too intense. Some people think that it's wonderful. Um, I don't personally have an opinion either way because I haven't played it yet. So I, um, I played that a few weeks ago, actually, and, uh, and I heard some of the controversy. Um, uh, it, to me, it's, it's very much a game for gamers that builds empathy for people with mental illness. Um, and a lot of people, it sounds like we're upset that um, someone who has uh, psychosis wouldn't really be able to play this game because it, it wasn't really designed for them, which is ironic, uh, and perhaps it should be, but I still think that game has a lot of value in uh, just the fact that um, anyone, a gamer, someone, someone uh, who plays a lot of games can play it and kind of um, maybe understand a, a tiny bit more what people with that kind of mental illness go through. I think it was really smart of them to use the number of subject matter experts that they did. Mm. Um, so I am making a game where I'm actively trying to teach empathy and so I'm kind of curious we talk about things like mental health and disabilities being blind having dyslexia um, depression and things and in terms of marketing that game uh, it's like this cute cat dating game and so we feel like that will reach a lot of people but if we tack on like um, yeah, this is also a game about mental health awareness and stuff. I, like, we're wondering if that will deter people away from it. Like, we feel like in trying to teach about empathy, we want people who don't necessarily know what depression is like to play the game so that they can learn more about it and maybe in real life know how to talk to somebody else. But then also a person who does suffer with depression can also play it to empathize with the characters in the game. So um, I'm just figuring I, I, out. I would personally just be, I mean, I personally, in the work that we do, we don't really use the term empathy building in a lot of ways. And I, I can't tell you why. Like, there's this there's quote, and I can never remember who said it. Um, she was a nun back. But she said that true empathy is knowing that you're not the other person, knowing that you're not the other person. 
So this idea of like walking in someone else's shoes is kind of a misnomer, which is why we really emphasize that we want to bring people in and hear it from them. There's also a Harvard Business Review study that shows that when managers try to empathize, what they do is they tend to take the feelings that this person has and then they internalize it around their own opinions and then they think that the solutions that they want are actually helping this other person. So empathy is really tricky in that way and I don't mean, to, I'm not trying to discourage you, I just, um, it's important to recognize like what, um, so I think you're very, um, I think it's very good that you're cautious about this. <laughs> Um, iThrive does free consultations to developers on this point, so I suspect that we will be talking after class. Okay, for sure. Yeah. I would make a great game and not tell anybody that it's an empathy game. That's kind of what we're leaning towards, but we're wondering if it would make a greater impact if we actively like said we're trying to approach this community. But, but like the mental health community, while we would love to make a game specifically for them, we're actually trying to reach the people who don't understand mental health issues. I, I think what I would say to that is market it the way you intend to market it for the audience, the, the core audience of your game, but also do side campaigns for these more mm -hmm. targeted audiences where you're gonna want to go to the mental health community and say, right. you know what, here was our intention with this game and we'd like to be in dialogue with you about how it can be used in these ways. Because I'm here to tell you that there are researchers around the world who are looking for games to build social emotional learning curriculums around. And if you can you know, maybe partner with some of those people, it's like, just like, oxen free, right? Um, that they did not say this is an empathy game, they just made their game and people are playing it, but I was so happy to meet him because I've got a pair of Norwegian researchers that really, really wants to talk to them because they want to do a social emotional learning curriculum around oxen free that they can use to teach that in schools. So yeah, I would do a secondary marketing push. Yeah, so you totally. prim your primary marketing push is to sell the game like you want to sell the game, and then after the cat's out of the bag, go ahead and do the secondary marketing push. I love puns so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, it's been an interesting session, but I, I'm, this question comes with an apology at the beginning for being like the downer on all of this. But we, you talked a lot about accessibility and building features in and trying to be more inclusive. Where does cost play into that? I mean, some of the things you talked about were cost free. Many of them are not, particularly if those tools are not already available. So how do you deal with that difficult question of, is this just too costly to include? That's a super fair question. You and I were talking about it last night. Yeah. Which is, you know, so the Able Gamers philosophy is, to make the game as accessible as you can make it while maintaining your vision and budget. If you think about accessibility early, accessibility is actually really cheap. If you try to bolt it on two weeks before release, it's really expensive. But I am not a believer in universal accessibility. I'm a gamer. I want your vision to be realized. And if your vision doesn't include me, I'll be disappointed, but I'm not going to fault you if you like, theoretically just can't do it. Um, that's my opinion, because as far as I'm concerned, I want your game to be as accessible as it can be, but I also want to make sure that no matter where I fall on whatever amazing disability spectrum, there's content that I can consume. If you're pushing a genre and you're pushing a story, I want your game to exist because it forwards the medium that I love so much. And if other games are created based on what you've done that I can play, I will reap the rewards that you created. I think some of it has to do with just building a good business case for it. I mean, the panel that you, the talk that he gave directly before this one laid out a really incredible business case for accessibility. Just, you know, you're leaving money on the table if you don't do this. I gave a, a GDC talk in 2016 about the business case for more we're inclusion in games. It's like if you aren't representing these folks, you're leaving money on the table. Um, that is something that we're working on at iThrive is how do we build the business case for 
you know, considering things like empathy and kindness in games, because there's going to be an audience for that too. And it's just a matter of finding out where the money is and showing them where the money is. Yeah, I'm going to second your point and say definitely start early. Um, as a as a programmer, uh, like it really helps when you know like if you need if you need to um, do like have uh, UI elements change color based on the color the color blindness settings. If you if you know that early on, it's much much easier to make that happen uh, as opposed to tacking it on at the last minute. So. But even better if you're using symbols instead of um, yeah of color as an indicator, or you're doing what's called second channeling, which is you have two ways of showing things off. Then you don't even have to worry about the colorblind mode at all because you've actually factored it completely out of the out of the equation. Don't don't match the red things, match the square things. I'm also going to encourage you to push back on your tooling. Voice this to your tooling as well. If it's something that you're doing in-house, make the business case to that team. If you're using an, a, an engine that you're paying for, like Unity or Unreal, Cocos 3, whatever it is, voice these needs to them as well. They only do, mostly, what the audience needs. And the larger voice you have bringing up these issues, the faster those toolings will get out to you. It's also, if you're, if you're able to, and you do the tooling in-house, you now have a business option as well to sell that tooling as well. You, you sell the game, and you can either keep that as your market share and your market advantage, but you can also turn around and sell that tooling. We try to encourage people to target a permanent disability or limit, physical limitation or limitation, and then think about this temporary and then the situational appearances of that limitation. So let me give you an example. Like, so if I design a game that's used to be someone, by someone who has one arm, um, I've also designed a game that works when someone's broken an arm, right? So it expands that. Or audience. holding a baby. Yep. Or holding a baby, which is actually the canonical one we use, which is holding a baby. But when Miyamoto at the Apple conference like said, "You can play Mario Go while eating a hamburger," that's my total new one. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? I mean, they bring up great points. So yeah. Hello. Just wanted to say I uh, really enjoyed your panel. Um, it's kind of a comment, but I'm hoping that you could add to it. I actually noticed that uh, as I get older and have more kids, I actually appreciate uh, more difficulty settings in games uh, because I, sometimes I just want to enjoy the story of a game and I don't have time to die multiple times. And then my time's up, I have to go to bed and I have work the next day. Uh, so when before, I mean, y very young me who used to play video games, you could not make a game too hard for me. Uh, and now, I, if there's an easy option, I'll always jump towards that, at least for my first playthrough. And then if I really enjoy the game, assuming I make it to the end, my second playthrough could be the harder one. Like, I'd never see a new game plus. So hopefully this is going to be a trend going forward as you know, gamers I, age. I talked to the lead developer of Deus Ex the, when it first came out, and he said like a third of his team was storytellers. and the bulk of their expense was voiceover work. And so when you first load the game, it like gives you a menu which is like, tell me a story, give me a challenge, or like I want the hardest thing in the world. And he said the reason why they did that was it would have been a tragedy if they spent all of this time and all of this money on storytelling and voicing that story. And the first jump puzzle, you throw the controller away, you now hate my franchise, and you didn't get to consume this story that I'm so proud of. So he goes, when you go on the easy mode, he's like, literally, you're just like, boom, boom, you're done. Boom, boom, you're done. Because he wants you to, to learn. Because it was a new IP at the time. So he wanted you to. Yeah, and like Witcher does that, Dragon Age, Mass Effect, there, a lot of them are doing that now. Um, what I was going to say is it would be interesting for you to take that uh, game motiv gamer motivation profile and um, then maybe take it every 10 years and see if your profile's changing, because it kind of sounds like it is. And that might be an interesting study for somebody to do. Thank you so much.